Good evening. Over the course of its 19-year existence, the Philadelphia-based American Music Theater Festival, or AMTF, garnered a national reputation for fostering and presenting innovative, often experimental works that blurred the lines between opera, theater, and musical theater. Its location was key to its success, far enough from New York City to cultivate a spirit of creative independence, but close enough to engage with the larger city's talent pool and cultural resources. This geographic and institutional balancing act was part of AMTF from its inception in 1983, when the festival's co-founders threw their support behind composer Anthony Davis's nascent opera X, The Life and Times of Malcolm X, which eventually went on to receive its official premiere at New York City Opera in 1986. In my presentation today, I'm using the development of X to examine the interinstitutional politics and mechanisms of contemporary opera production. In the next 20 minutes or so, I'll briefly sketch out how X intersected with a number of very different institutions. And in doing so, map the racial topography of American opera in the 1980s. Over the course of its three-year gestation, X was developed by the Kitchen Center for Video, Music, Dance, Performance, and Film, the Brooklyn Academy of Music, or BAM, City Opera, the Springfield Symphony, and, of course, AMTF. The heterogeneity of these institutions is best illustrated by the fact that when X eventually came to City Opera, Davis and the opera's creative team effectively became the first artists to racially integrate the company's nearly all-white orchestra by requiring the inclusion of Davis's improvisatory ensemble, Epistemy. This presentation draws on new interviews and archival materials to build on Sasha Metcalf's pioneering work into AMTF and to reveal how the festival functioned as a sort of artistic incubator whose dedication to aesthetic experimentation was matched by an equally strong commitment to political progressivism. With X, this latter unstated element of AMTF's mission ultimately resulted in a kind of short-term transfer of institutional values, one with significant social and economic ramifications for city opera. So, to begin a bit about AMTF. The festival was created by singer-turned-impresario Marjorie Samoff and composer-critic Eric Salzman. They wanted to do something about what they saw as the increasing commercialization of musical theater and diminishing opportunities for experimental art. Samoff convinced Salzman of both the location, Philadelphia, and the institutional structure, a festival, of their eventual collaboration. I had worked at the Avignon Festival, Samoff later explained, and seen the roles festivals can play in innovation. In their introductory program note for the first festival, the founders lay out AMTF's mission. They positioned music theater as a field in flux, one that cut across cultural boundaries of art and entertainment and generic categories of opera, musical theater, and experimental theater. The special conditions of a festival, they predicted, will strike sparks and create an environment in which music theater can flourish and grow. Beyond the traditional institution of Broadway and opera, they wrote the following year, a festival can be a source of artistic ferment, an incubator, a catalyst, a home base, and a lively center for new music theater. According to their philosophy, process outweighed product, and they framed the initial festival offerings as part of a long-range vision of development. But the festival also featured another unstated goal, supporting artists of color who faced additional hurdles to accessing funding and resources, especially for large-scale works. Our mission, Samoff told me last year, was to premiere new work from all different cultural and musical orientations, and we had a huge commitment to artists of color. We did more work by artists of color than almost any other theater. To that end, AMTF's first season, including Noah Ain's Jazz Chamber Opera Trio, Coleridge Taylor Perkinson's The Emperor Jones, and Davis's X, featured predominantly black casts and or creative teams. Davis was an ideal fit for the fledgling festival. By the early 1980s, he had established a reputation within New York City's avant-garde circles as a composer and pianist of note. His 10-piece ensemble Epistemy, formed in 1979, specialized in exploring the interaction of notated and improvised music. The idea for X stretched back to 1980, when his younger brother, Christopher, a stage actor and director, suggested collaborating on a musical based on the autobiography of Malcolm X. The references to music throughout the autobiography, Christopher thought, 
could translate effectively into a musical score and book that traced the parallel journeys of Malcolm's political development and jazz's musical evolution from big band to bebop to free jazz, a sort of jazz historiography that David Gutkin examines in his compelling study of this opera. But Davis demurred, noting that if he composed something about Malcolm X, it would have to be an opera, owing to what he saw as a lowbrow tradition of frivolity in black musical theater. Davis relished the opportunity to bring a controversial political subject and icon of black American culture into the realm of opera. This was his hidden agenda, he explained, to confront people with the preconceived notion of black music being less than high art or commercial art. Along with Anthony and Christopher, the opera's creative team included their cousin, Tulani Davis, a poet and then village voice writer. They envisioned X as a sprawling three-act grand opera that would depict the controversial black leader's life from the time of his father's murder in 1925 to his own assassination in Manhattan's Audubon Ballroom in 1965. In its final form, the opera centers on Malcolm X's two conversions, first from Malcolm Little to Malcolm X with his embrace of the Nation of Islam, and later his adoption of the name al Haj Malik al Shabazz with his conversion to Orthodox Islam. The opportunity to start working on the opera arrived when Mary MacArthur, the kitchen's executive director, asked Davis if he had any ideas for an opera. Davis had performed at the kitchen at least twice already with Epistemy, thanks in part to the kitchen music director George Lewis's advocacy for black experimentalism in the downtown art scene. By the time of the ensemble's second appearance there in 1983, MacArthur was searching the downtown scene for opera projects. She had good reason. Theatrical works had by then become something of a trend among downtown composers. With the success of Einstein on the Beach at the Metropolitan Opera in 1976 and Satyagraha at BAM in 1981, opera was perceived as not only economically viable, but artistically vital. MacArthur told me that her position on an NEA opera panel in the early 1980s made her, quote, realize that there was an opportunity for people who weren't generally considered opera writers. The kitchen was well positioned to help a project like this get off the ground, especially considering that Davis, an improvising composer and operatic novice, lacked entree to major opera institutions. As a multidisciplinary arts institution, the kitchen allowed individual artists to tap into public funding sources otherwise unavailable to them. In return, the kitchen received a 7 to 10% cut of any awarded grants. In the wake of Reagan era cuts to public arts funding in the early 1980s, MacArthur tasked employees with aggressively pursuing grant op possibilities. During one year, the kitchen submitted 28 proposals to the National Endowment for the Arts. MacArthur's initial steps with Davis were well-timed. She had been asked by Harvey Lichtenstein, BAM's president, to help him plan a sampler concert for the annual Opera America Conference that December in New York City. This musical showcase, titled New Directions in Opera, was designed to introduce opera administrators from around the country to the vitality of downtown artists and musicians working within the sphere of music theater. The hoped for result, according to Opera America's then president, David DiChiara, would be, quote, a process of education, exposure, and the tearing down of artistic walls, end quote. With the inclusion of X, these walls were racial as well. While putting together an NEA grant application through the kitchen, which was successful, Davis agreed to prepare two excerpts for the December showcase. I'm known for being crazy, he later reflected, so I said, oh sure, I could do that. In the showcase, two excerpts from Act Three, adapted from earlier works, were performed alongside works by Meredith Monk, Robert Ashley, Bob Telson, and John Gibson, all BAM and or Kitchen-affiliated artists. Once Samoff got wind of Davis's opera project around this time, she contacted the composer about providing a venue for developing the work. She and Salzman, together with a representative from the kitchen, met with the Davises in early February. Their project deadlines were, shall we say, ambitious. Act 1 completed by March 7th, Act 2 by April 1st, and Act 3 by May 1st. Now, with a few historical exceptions, one does not simply compose an opera in three months. And in fact, X was created and revised over the better part of three years. 
While Davis composed, AMTF pursued funding from the American Music Center, the Jerome Foundation, and Meet the Composer. But as a nascent festival, AMTF faced logistic and economic hurdles in developing a new opera about Malcolm X, whose legacy in the early 1980s, I should add, was still viewed with suspicion by many Americans. The first obstacle, frankly, was funders, Samoff said when I spoke with her. People then, and maybe people today, didn't like the idea of doing an opera about Malcolm X. It was a controversial subject, end quote. Two potential funders, both large insurance companies, declined to support the opera for this reason. By the time the festival officially opened in June 1984, Davis and his collaborators had, quite understandably, not yet completed the opera. Presented as a, quote, work in progress at the 400-seat Trocadero Theater in Philadelphia, X consisted of a staged sampler of Act I accompanied by Epistemy, followed by a concert presentation of Act II and Three arias accompanied by piano. Even in this early form, critics praised X, singling out Davis's arresting musical language, the story's inherent drama, and the excellence of the vocal and instrumental performances. Thanks to promising reviews and aggressive networking, X continued to develop after its first presentation. And you can see here a timeline of X's development after its first presentation. Uh, and as well, its intersections with various institutions. By ultimately emphasizing process over product, AMTF functioned as a sort of incubator. Davis used an April 1985 engagement with the Springfield Symphony, billed as a concert premiere, as an opportunity to expand the orchestration, combining the 10-member Epistemy Ensemble with the 26-person Symphony Orchestra. Now, this incremental, iterative approach was not unique. It became increasingly popular in the 1980s. Between 1982 and 1986, the NEA's Opera Musical Theater Program saw a surge in applications for workshops, and the NEA's support increased from $40,000 for four workshops in 1982 to $178,000 for nine workshops four years later. In December 1984, Samoff wrote to Harvey Lichtenstein at BAM to, quote, explore the possible collaboration of the festival with BAM, both on the workshop and on the full-scale premiere of X, end quote, which was tentatively planned for the 1985 season. Samoff also inquired about the possibility of having BAM host a four-week workshop of X, which would be held in May and June of 1984 and funded by the National Institute for Music Theater. Lichtenstein agreed to Samoff's request for a workshop. In fact, he and others at BAM had kept a close eye on the opera's development since, since its inception. A BAM memo from January 1984, for instance, which is right when AMTF stepped into the process, expressed concern that Anthony is being launched on a sensitive process to develop his art, and he should be receiving appropriate guidance from an experienced producing organization in the area of workshops. Joe Melillo, the architect of BAM's Next Way Festival, told me that in developing X and focusing and fostering its growth, AMTF did what BAM could not. In the 1980s, BAM increasingly positioned itself as an arts presenter rather than producer, with the Next Wave Festival as its signature offering from 1983 onward. Functioning as a sort of field team, Melillo's term, AMTF allowed BAM to evaluate projects it was interested in before determining whether or not to present them. But BAM never ended up presenting X. According to Melillo, BAM's involvement would have necessitated stepping into a producing role, which lay outside their purview. There was also apparently a disagreement over the opera's scope, the Davises envisioned X as a grand Wagner-esque opera, but BAM wanted to present it in their smaller theater rather than their opera house. In the end, X was never performed at BAM. Most of the Davises' efforts to find additional presenters faced similar outcomes in ways that reveal the racial and structurally racist contours of American opera institutions in the 1980s. Representatives from the San Francisco Opera suggested that X could be presented as part of their inner city opera in the parks program. Davis responded by asking if they would consider mounting Philip Glass's Einstein on the beach in the park. In discussions with David DiChiera, the head of Michigan Opera Theater, Davis recalls explaining, this is a piece for Michigan, really. You have a 50% black population that probably never sets foot in your theater. 
wouldn't it be nice to have them come? And I guess he decided it wouldn't. Ed Korn, the executive director of the artistically progressive Minnesota Opera, expressed interest in the opera early on, but withdrew his consideration when he realized it would be prohibitively expensive to produce X, since it featured a nearly all-black cast and Minnesota Opera had no local artists of color that they worked with regularly. And yet this, according to the Davises, was a key reason for making the opera, and one that resonated with Malcolm X's own advocacy of black economic self-determination. When I spoke with him, Christopher said, quote, we really felt ever more strongly that it was our role to create a black repertoire for these singers. There was just a lack of awareness of the business aspect of the piece and how important it is to get black pieces into the repertoire so that those singers have a full-time job and are not just brought in to do it, end quote. The BAM workshop in 1985 had an unexpected outcome. The conductor Christopher Keene, then City Opera's artistic supervisor, attended one of the final rehearsals and insisted to Beverly Sills, City Opera's general director, that they program it. She agreed. The company had a long tradition of supporting new American works, stretching back to the 1949 premiere of William Grant Stills' Troubled Island. After taking over in 1979, Sills had begun returning City Opera to its American roots, mixing operettas and Broadway musicals into its repertory and programming newer works, such as Carlisle Floyd's Of Mice and Men, Glasses Akhenaten, and Dominic Argento's Casanova. X would become the company's 20th world premiere. Sills presented Samoff with an offer that was something of a poisoned apple. City Opera wanted to produce X, a turn of events that encapsulated everything Samoff and Salzman had hoped for with the festival, but only if AMTF did not give their planned 1985 premiere of the revised opera, since the money City Opera had for a new work was allocated for a premiere. Sills and Samoff eventually reached an agreement whereby AMTF's production in fall 1985 would be referred to as the, quote, first full production, and City Opera would claim the world premiere the following September. Perhaps unsurprisingly, Sills, like Samoff, faced funding difficulties due to the opera's subject. The $250,000 Sills had been offered from the Lila Wallace Reader's Digest Fund to commission and produce a new American opera was retracted when she chose X. Undeterred, Sills and Davis made up for lost funding, in part through appeals to New York City's black communities. X's appearance at City Opera in 1986 was comparable in importance to Stills' premiere with the company nearly four decades earlier, and serves as only the most visible example of the growth of black opera in the 1980s. While Davis was composing X, composers including Ulysses K., Dorothy Rudmore, and Thea Musgrave centered their own operas on black subjects such as Frederick Douglass and Harriet Tubman, and improvising composers like Anthony Braxton and Leo Smith also experimented with opera. These operas, through their engagement with black subjects and participants, constitute part of what Naomi Andre has identified as a shadow culture in opera. And X marks a significant moment when the parallel lineages of white and black American opera intersected. The jazz critic Francis Davis emphasized at the time just how significant this moment was, writing, major new operas are rare enough, but works of this scale by black composers are all but non-existent. Unlike their classical and theatrical counterparts who enjoyed the benefit of well-established institutional support systems, jazz composers must apply for funding as individuals, which effectively rules out the possibility of a jazz composer raising a quarter of a million dollars for a single project. Beyond the aforementioned funding difficulties, this intersection of opera cultures had other implications for both the production and reception of the opera. Davis's incorporation of his ensemble into the orchestra had very real ramifications for City Opera's unionized players. Some of them were replaced. This is an orchestra that wasn't even integrated. I forced integration on the orchestra, David said, Davis said. All of a sudden, they had seven or eight black performers inside the orchestra. There was a lot of resentment, but I also think in a way it was kind of healthy that we had to work it out and do the performances. All four performances at City Opera sold out, and the company's programming of X broadened their audience demographic. By Davis's estimate, at least half of the opening night audience was black, with attendees bussing in from Harlem and many would-be audience members who could not get in. But, Davis reflected nine years later, 
I think it was a lost opportunity in terms of the opera world because they could have sold out 10 more performances. It hasn't even been revived again. And I think part of it was that they were uncomfortable with the new audience. The fact that X has been fully revived only once in the last 34 years speaks to the racial homogeneity and rigidity of America's opera institutions. Notwithstanding the welcome surge of black operas in recent years by Tanya Leone, Terence Blanchard, and others, as William Robin has documented in his study of the New York Philharmonic's Horizons Festivals, efforts at supporting underrepresented composers in the 1980s often faltered in the face of major music institutions' conservatism. AMTF, through its emphasis on process and its vigorous networking, succeeded in diversifying one of America's major opera institutions, although this integration was short-lived. In the long term, however, the festival's advocacy had the effect of jump-starting Davis's opera career. He has since composed for the Lyric Opera of Chicago, Opera Theater of St. Louis, and Long Beach Opera. And of course, his latest opera, Central Park Five, won this year's Pulitzer Prize in Music. Regardless of whether or not X enters the American repertory, the opera and its creators serve as trailblazing role models, demonstrating the viability and visibility of black American opera at a time when it existed largely in the shadows. Thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Justin Johnston and I'm a professor of music industry here at Bowling Green State University. Uh, today I'm going to be talking about a copyright case that has been in the news lately involving Taylor Swift, her former record label, Big Machine Records, and an influential artist manager named Scooter Braun. As a little bit of an introduction, in 2019, Taylor Swift was to be presented with the Artist of the Decade Award at the American Music Awards. But in the weeks leading up to that uh, award ceremony, Taylor announced through social media that her former record label, Big Machine, was blocking her from performing her own music at her own award ceremony. This would lead to a public feud between Taylor Swift her former record label, and Scooter Braun, who we'll talk about momentarily. Ultimately, this is a story about the power of social media, issues of artistic ownership, and the coming sea change that will affect fundamental business models in the music industry. But first, I want to break this down into a few sections. First, we're going to do some timeline about Taylor Swift's career. We'll have a discussion about record deals and how they work fundamentally, and then some analysis of the events as they unfolded, including some updates that happened just a few weeks ago. To begin, in 2005, a relatively unknown label called Big Machine Records signed Taylor Swift at the age of 15. If you hadn't heard of Big Machine Records at that time, that wouldn't surprise most people because they'd never signed a major hit, and in fact, they had just started a business. The label was founded by this man, Scott Borchetta. Uh, it continues to be based in Nashville. Taylor Swift was the first big act signed by Big Machine, and as of 2019, we know that her records generated 80% of the label's revenue. Now at that time, Big Machine was a relatively unknown label, but also it's important to understand that Taylor Swift was a relatively unknown artist. Uh, she had not signed uh, any record deals previously. She had not published or recorded any music previously. She didn't have the hit records that she has today. But Big Machine recognized the talent that she had, and they signed a six-record deal. And as part of that deal, Big Machine would own the masters to all six records. Before we go further, I did want to take a minute to explain how record deals work in the most fundamental way. In most record deals, an artist promises to produce a certain number of records for the label. And in exchange, the record label promises to pay in advance for each record. Once those records go on sale, the artist will continue to collect songwriter royalties for every record sold uh, if the artist is the songwriter as well. But the artist will not collect performance royalties until or if 
the record becomes profitable. But this brings up an interesting question of who actually owns a record. Well, in American copyright law, every record has at least two copyrights in play. The first belongs to the songwriter. When a songwriter writes a song, they own the rights to the composition, and these are often referred to as mechanical rights. When a performer records a song, they, at least at first, own the rights to the recording. That's called the master rights. But in most record deals, record labels recognize that they're taking on considerable risk. They may invest uh, hundreds of thousands, millions of dollars into an artist and never recoup those expenses through album sales. In addition, when they pay in advance to an artist, the artist never has to repay that advance even if the album is unprofitable. For those reasons, the record label wants to set up certain advantages for themselves, including the right to drop an artist at any time, but in addition, the artist cannot leave the contract until the contract has expired. And finally, in most cases, the record label uh, requires that the artist assign all master rights to, of recordings to the label. And through that arrangement, the record label generally collects about 80% of the revenue from sales and pays an artist a royalty based on those sales once the record becomes profitable. And what does it really mean to own a master? Well, having the master rights comes with considerable power and privilege. First of all, the owner of the master rights controls when the recording can be played. They can control when and if the recording goes on sale. They can control any licensing decisions for film, TV, sampling, and other recordings. But what they do not control is the right to make a cover recording. The right to make a cover recording or a second recording of the same song traditionally belongs to the songwriter. That's part of the mechanical rights. Unless, as part of a record deal, the artist signs away their cover recording rights as well. And that was the case with Taylor Swift. In Taylor Swift's record deal, she agreed uh, or was offered the opportunity to earn back her masters if she decided to sign a second six album contract. And in addition, she agreed she would not be able to re-record or make a cover of any of her old songs until November of 2020. And remember, this was an agreement made in 2005. So she agreed she'd have to wait 15 years before she could re-record any songs. And as an example of how this buyback system works, the only way Taylor Swift could earn back her master rights to her first album would be to create a seventh album. Creating an eighth album would allow her to buy back her second album, a ninth album would earn her back her third, and so on, so that she would not be able to own her master rights for her complete catalog until she'd produced 12 albums for Big Machine. And that would be 12 albums across two six record contracts. And it's from that discussion, you can see that there was risk and reward for both the artist and the label, and in that case, and it did pay off initially. Uh, in one year later, in 2006, Taylor Swift had her first top 10 single with Tim McGraw, and in 2009, she won a video music award. That event would go on to become infamous uh, for uh, a moment when, as Taylor was receiving her award on stage, Kanye West came up as well and declared that, in fact, Beyonce had the best video of all time. Kanye, of course, was the, uh, the most infamous person in this story, but behind Kanye was his manager, someone named Scooter Braun. And if you're not uh, as familiar with the music industry, it's possible you never heard of Scooter Braun before. But he's one of, if not the most influential manager in the industry today. His clients include Kanye West, Justin Bieber, and Ariana Grande. And his firm is uh, often referred to as SB Projects. Scooter Braun, uh, for the next 
10 years or so would go on to wager a bullying campaign against Taylor Swift, often through his clients and through his own social media channels. Um, those clients most specifically being Kanye West and Justin Bieber. Kanye West, uh, after the Video Music Awards moment, would later go on to create a video that, uh, in Taylor's words, amounted to revenge porn. He would post private phone calls between himself and Taylor Swift and would instigate social media feuds that would often include Justin Bieber. Scooter Braun was often encouraging, allegedly, and involved in much of this bullying campaign and would be the source of quite a few complications in Taylor Swift's career. And just to be clear, uh, there are two people with very similar names, and that's Scott Borchetta, owner of Big Machine Records, Taylor Swift's record label, and also Scooter Braun. These two men would also come to do business together a few years later. In November of 2018, Taylor had completed her sixth record contract with Big Machine and had entered negotiations for a second contract with the label. They were not able to reach an agreement and Taylor ultimately decided to sign a new contract with Republic Records. She ended up having a much more favorable deal with Republic where she would be able to own her masters and it would be a six record deal. As of November of 2020, she has recorded two of those records, both of which are platinum selling albums and the only two platinum selling albums of the past year. That was November of 2018. About one year later, Big Machine announced that they were selling their company to SB Projects. In other words, Scooter Braun, who had been the source of bullying throughout much of Taylor's career, now owned the rights to her first six albums, roughly 13, 14 years worth of creative work from Taylor. Taylor Swift, who was active on many social media platforms and was adept at uh, mobilizing her fans, posted a long um, post on Tumblr where she said, among other things, when I left my masters in Scott's hands, I made peace with the fact that eventually he would sell them. Never in my worst nightmares did I imagine the buyer would be Scooter. Well, what does it actually mean for Scooter Braun and SB Projects to now own the masters? It means that Scooter Braun owns 14 years worth of Taylor's work, sort of. He owns the rights only to the recordings. He does not own the rights to the songs or live performance of these songs. Those are the rights of the song writer, not the record label. So in acquiring the label, he did not also acquire the songwriter's mechanical rights. He does, however, own the right to license any public performance of the recording. That could include, for instance, a broadcast of the recording. Continuing on in this timeline, Big Machine sold to SB Projects in June of 2019, and it was a few months later, in November, that Taylor announced that SB Projects and Big Machine were attempting to block Taylor Swift from performing her older songs at the American Music Awards, where she would be performing and accepting an award for Artist of the Decade. There were a lot of press releases about this. Many of them had very conflicting stories, and so I wanted to break this down with a few quotes. Taylor claimed that Scooter Braun and Big Machine were blocking the license because it violates her re-recording clause. They were claiming that performing on this stage would uh, constitute a re-recording, at least according to Taylor's account of the events. She also claims that they are blocking the use of her songs in a Netflix special, a documentary that would be released a few months later. SB Projects, Scooter Braun's company, responded by saying, it should be noted that recording artists do not need label approval for live performances on television or any other live media. The statement goes on to say, record label approval is only needed for contracted artists audio and visual recordings and in determining 
how those works are distributed. After a few weeks, uh, this would be settled and there would be an agreement reached and the final uh, press release from Big Machine Label said, uh, Big Machine Label Group and Dick Clark Productions, who are responsible for the AMAs, announced that they have come to terms on a licensing agreement that approves their artists' performances to stream post-show and for rebroadcast on mutually approved platforms. This includes the upcoming American Music Award performances for Thomas Rhett and former Big Machine Records recording artist Taylor Swift. And it was at this point that Taylor moved the discussion off of traditional media channels and shifted to addressing her fans directly through social media. On Tumblr, there was a large movement of Taylor Swift hashtags dominating feeds on Tumblr. And on music streaming platforms, Swift fans um, started a protest by streaming The Man in bulk. And unfortunately, some Swift fans took it too far by doxing Big Machine employees, meaning uh, releasing the personal information like addresses, telephone numbers of Big Machine employees. So what's actually going on here? Well, I had three theories going into this story a year ago, and I'll present them here. First, there is a theory that Taylor wasn't actually going to perform fully live, that she was always going to lip sync at least partially to recordings. Um, and while Taylor Swift is known for performing live, it is common, not unusual, for artists to perform uh, with recordings at award shows, given the limited rehearsal time and logistics involved. Theory two was that Big Machine wasn't trying to block the performance, they were just trying to block the broadcast and reproduction, which would be, arguably, their right. And theory three, related to the Netflix documentary, was that they weren't blocking the documentary, they just didn't want to allow old songs to be part of the soundtrack. The results of this uh, ended with Taylor Swift being able to perform her complete catalog at the American Music Awards. Big Machine's reputation was damaged, but they were still a very profitable company, as we'll see momentarily. And a year ago, when I first started looking into this story, I asked three questions or three things to watch for. One, would there be increased viewership at the American Music Awards? Would Taylor eventually re-record her old albums? And will there be uh, a change in the industry to give master rights to artists? Well, in 2020, we have a few updates. Was there increased viewership at the AMAs? Only slightly. It was slightly higher viewership compared to the year before, but nowhere near the peak of a few years earlier. Would Taylor eventually re-record her own albums? Well, right now, we're recording this lecture in November of 2020, which is officially the first month when Taylor is able to begin re-recording her old albums. And she has said, she will start that project and she would encourage her fans uh, to purchase or stream only the new re-recorded albums which she would own and therefore be able to profit from. But actually, just before we started recording this lecture, there was new information coming out that Scooter Braun and SB Projects have now sold Taylor Swift's old catalog to a third party. Uh, an investment fund known as Shamrock Holdings. They did so without notifying Taylor Swift. <clears throat> and in fact, even though the catalog has been sold to Shamrock Holdings, press releases do indicate that Scooter Braun, at least for a limited period of time, will continue to profit from revenue generated by Taylor Swift's catalog. So in the end, there are a few points here that are worth examining. First of all, owning the master rights continues to be a controversial topic in the music industry. Uh, and similarly, the power of social media continues to shape the industry landscape, but at times it can obscure the nuances of a complex subject like copyright ownership. The time we've taken today to discuss this issue in 30 minutes um, is substantially more nuanced than what you might be able to read in a tweet or a Facebook post. 
And while there hasn't been a successful business model yet, progressive labels and distributors are looking for new ways to support artists without owning their masters. And more and more, with the advent of digital production and distribution, the gatekeeping that used to belong to record labels has diminished. And in some ways, we have to wonder if as their role diminishes, will the artists gain more leverage in negotiating record contracts. Thank you for attending this lecture, and we look forward to seeing you next semester.